Hi everyone, I'm Shelly and you're watching There's No Place Like Home. On this week's Question the Narrative video, I really just wanted to explore some old world Philadelphia architecture because I think that it's absolutely mind blowing. It's stunning. I, I've also been reflecting a lot about the reset because I've had some people ask me why there would need to be a reset, why the controllers would do such a thing, and also how they might go about doing that. And I certainly don't have the answers to that. I can only have the things that I speculate. And ultimately, the why behind it is that I think that the controllers are so busy playing God that they want to make sure that they hide any and all evidence of God, whether that would be any sort of biblical evidence from free flood evidence, even to evidence of a millennial kingdom, which many people are now coming to believe has already happened. The thousand year reign. Yeah. A lot of people think that it's already happened. I'm on the fence about it. Considering that the Mount, Mount Olives, at least that I've seen has not split. And also um, just the lack of instruction in, about the short season in the Bible. So if you have any thoughts on that, if you could leave a comment, but I think the controllers, they want power. That's what it's always about is power, isn't it? Money, power, greed, and yeah, people are evil. And unfortunately, we've, we have evil people who are underneath the world governments. So how? Let's talk about how. How would they go about doing that? I don't know about the physicality of it, about the destruction, other than, you know, maybe wars um, and those sorts of activities. But I can talk to you about psychologically how they would do this. If we get too advanced, and I believe that that may be what happened in the past, we become too hard to control. So what do they do? They start demeaning us. They start telling us that. We come from monkeys. We're just a higher form of animal. And they teach us that our ancestors were all primitive while at the same time presenting us with architecture like this. This isn't primitive, but that's what we hear. And, and you know, most of us, we don't question it. For most of my life, I didn't question it. I saw these beautiful structures and I thought, oh, wow, that is so cool. They had such pretty buildings back then. I wish they looked like that now. But I never thought about how they could have done these things and why things aren't like that anymore. So I, I think that a lot of it is psychological. We have such low expectations of ourselves that we don't even think twice about it when we see old buildings like this. We just automatically go back to what we've been told that our ancestors were primitive and that we are, you know, everything there is now, you know, we're so high tech right now, yet we can't even build the, the beautiful things that we see all around us. Although I'm sure that, well, I think that now with our technology, we could, but if we would have the technology that they were said to have at that time, I don't think that it would be so easy. So how, how do they go about doing it beyond that? Well, I think that they establish world governments who are really puppets, that they're puppets of, of the controllers, and they control the progress and development with restrictive government that, that again, is, is run by those people that we look at as world leaders, but I have a very strong suspicion that they're not really the ones that are in charge. So they, once we start though, once we start getting to that level of, of, um, advancement, we start to rebel. I think that what's happening now, and I'm looking at things that are happening right now in the world, people are rebelling. They're asking questions. If you look before the whole, um, pandemic started, we had the yellow vest movements all over the place right before that. And yet no talk of that now. And I can't, you know, help but see that as a piece of the puzzle. So they have all of these now oppressive um, lockdowns. Um, they're, they've already had Agenda 20 and, uh, sorry, Agenda 21 and Agenda 30, 2030. I cannot even like think straight today. 
And yeah, they, they do have, they, they create wars because they create chaos. They destroy things. They, um, they add, they add to the chaos of the world with the dissolution of morals, which we are seeing that now. So if you're asking, how can you reset a society? That's a great way to get things to start crumbling. You see people getting too advanced. It's time to bring them crashing back down to reality. And to be quite honest with you, that's why I'm fully expecting that we are on the fringe of another reset. I, I'm just now. I pray every day that Jesus will return and that that will be our reset. But I don't know. I'm just at the point now where I see things spiraling out of control and I don't see, I don't see the controllers letting us get much further. I, I kind of look at this as akin to the Tower of Babel. You know, in the Tower of Babel, um, the, the people wanted to rebel against God. They were, they were making war with God. And so he um, destroyed that culture. He, he broke up their languages and Tower of Babel in itself was a reset. And I talked about this in an earlier video. And I see what's going on now almost as a parallel to that, except now it's not God that we're rebelling against, but it is controllers who are trying to play God. And now we, the people are starting to rebel against them. And I fear that they are going to try to take a page out of, out of the Lord's playbook and do the same thing to us. So those are my thoughts on the reset. Now it's time to get into Philadelphia. I only live about an hour, maybe an hour and a half away from Philadelphia. And I've been to Philadelphia, but I've only ever been there to be at hospitals. I was there, actually, no, I was at the, the Franklin Institute when I was a child in Independence Hall and everything was school. Although I don't remember much of that, but as an adult, I've only been there like to go to St. Christopher's hospital when my, um, 21 year old son needed to have some testing done. And I never took the time to actually walk around and look at the architecture there. So I decided to go online because I know that there's beautiful buildings there. If you just look at the city hall of Philadelphia, which we'll be looking at today, but I wanted to see what else there was and maybe what else there used to be that might not be there anymore. So the first thing that I came up with was Pennsylvania Hall. And this is no longer standing. And this is obviously just an artist's rendering of it. Now, oh, I see it burned. Surprise, surprise. So this was built in 1838. And while I automatically notice what we, we look at as the, to me, the Greco-Roman what we would call the Greco-Roman features of buildings, although I'm starting to look at this just as a worldwide architectural style. But what do you notice here? Well, I noticed what looked to be mud flood windows. And this was 1838, and this is an artist's rendering. And so we cannot, obviously we can't say they're all coal shoots. And we also can't go to the notion that the street levels were raised because of sewage, because in 1838, there was no sewage. The earliest that any of the street levels were supposed to have been raised in the United States was in Chicago in 1850. So that can't be the, the notion or the, uh, the reason for it either. So anyway, I found that to be interesting. So next we have here, this is the family court building in Philadelphia. So it was, well, I think it was just picture was taken on May 3rd, 2013. Um, let me see. No, it doesn't say what, oh, hold on. Was designed by Morton Keese from 1931 plans. Okay. So it was built from 1938 to 1941. So we have this, and again, we have just this beautiful intric intricacies. And so I think that a lot of times we do see a lot of these later, these, these buildings that are being built later. And I think that what is happening is that the people who are designing these buildings are, you know, they're, they're copying off of the style of, of the older buildings. This is another one that I found. This is the Apprentices Library in Philadelphia. And again, obviously a rendering, but what do you see here again? 
These are mud flood windows. This was in the 1800s. Let me find out what year the, apprentice, the Apprentice's Library was. All right, so apparently the Apprentice's Library was the first free circulating library in America, and it was built in 1820. And 1820, again, obviously, is before the years that the streets would have been raised. Oh, actually, was that an actual picture of it? Let me go back there. Hoping I can, uh, let's see if we can find some actual images of it. But I wanna see if those were actual street level, AKA mud flood windows in 1820, because again, that would completely dispel the notion of raising the, the streets. Let's see. Um, let's just, I should probably type in Philadelphia too, shouldn't I? I'm sure that wasn't the only one. And I know that it was moved, I think, in the 40s, in 1940s. I think that's the one that I have there. Um, is this it here? Doesn't look exactly the same. Oh yeah, okay, I can kind of see that now. And yeah, that does. That does look like the mud flood windows to me. So again, built in 1820, and we have that going on. So this right here is beautiful. This is City Hall, Philadelphia City Hall. And I cannot get over the detail on this building. I also cannot get over, the first of all, look how big it is. Look at the size of these people compared to this building. Um, we're going to actually read a little bit about it in a second, but I just want to look at the, the enormity of it. And I just keep thinking to myself, that is one big city hall. Like, why would you ever need a city hall that size in the 1800s? Um, let's read a little bit about it. So when was it made? It just says tallest in the world from 1894 to 1908. Does that mean that that's when it was built was in 1894? Actually, no, I saw another. Okay. It was constructed from 1871 to 1901. Now this picture here, I might actually already have this one. Uh, we'll just look at it here. But when I was looking at this earlier, I thought to my, I thought at first, that th these were actually on the side of the building. Sometimes you will see, you know, painted on the brick buildings, advertisements, but I actually think this is like a uh, wall that's around the outside of it. And it said that this is when it was being built. If you ask me though, <laughs> I think that this looks to be very old. It's hard to tell on black and white photos, so I could be wrong, but this looks to be very old. Again, there's, there's no mess around here like it's a building site. No sort of cleanup is needed, no building supplies anywhere. Even if it were on a weekend, I've been by, building, by construction sites and it's never this neat and tidy. And to me, it, it seems like it's more likely to be a renovation than an actual building site. But remember that everything that I say in here is speculation. You always have to take what I say with a grain of salt, just like you have to take history with a grain of salt nowadays. But anyway, so that is Philadelphia City Hall. One interesting thing that you will see later is that now here, this tower looks dark. When you see City Hall nowadays, it looks white to me, yet I tried to look it up to see if this was changed out and it doesn't say that it was. So I don't know what that's all about. Ah, here we go. So I don't know what that's all about. You'll see here that that's it. I don't know. Maybe they added it. I was trying to find it. I didn't see anything, but this is definitely a different color than what was in the black and white photo. I don't think that it would have come up that dark. I know they did some renovations to it. 
possibly they painted it, but I don't know why they would paint it a different color from all of their other build or from all the rest of the building. This is the Philadelphia Reading Railroad Terminal. This was built in 1884 and it's it's no longer standing, but Again, I'm just looking at the sheer size of it. I know that they made this also to be the headquarters of the railroad terminal. But again, I'm just thinking to myself back in a time with, you know, horse and buggies and we do have trolleys. Uh, to me, that's a very, it's a very extravagant building. And even look at the buildings next to it. For a time such as this. And as always, you have what certainly appears to be mud flood windows down there. So right here, I, ha I pulled up the Reading Terminal, and here, here it is. Very pretty, like most other of the older buildings. I can't say the newer buildings there are pretty, but the older buildings are all very nice there. Uh, let me see. We'll go back. Yeah, because I just wanted to see what year it was built. Oh, okay, so it was open in 1893 thought I read that it was built in 1884, but regardless, it's still the late 1800s, back around those key years that I always talk about. So I just realized that I said that this wasn't here anymore. I think that I said it about this. My mind is like so muddled today. But anyway, apparently at least part of it is because we saw this. So if you live in Philly, let me know if you know anything at all about that place. Um, let me see what else I have here. We already read about City Hall. Okay, here's something else that's very interesting. So this is a map of Philadelphia and parts adja adjacent, depicting the State House as it appeared in 1752. 1752, what do you see here? I see mud flood windows, 1752. So to me, it just, it, I've had I've had builders commenting on actually it was last my last video and they were saying that they wouldn't have built things this way. So there's that. I need to go take a walk down here. This is Independence Hall. Got the mud flood windows there. And you know, as you can see, now some of the other architecture looked to be what they would call Greco-Roman, and this this is not like that. This one is I'm certainly no um, art expert, maybe more colonial, but you know, as always, you can see the bell tower there and the bell towers really remind me of the cupola that you will see at the tops of a lot of cathedrals. But as always, we've got the ever present mud flood windows that we are told mean nothing. So anyway, I just thought that it would be interesting to look at this stuff because we've always got people telling us that it's from the raising of the street levels. That's the newest excuse is that it's the raising of the street levels for sewage. But if they were built before that time, that's not the reason that it's like this. So I said that I was going to go over some things that people leave me in the comments or email to me. And I talked about Kansas City last week and I talked about some of their older buildings, but I decided to look and see if they had an underground history in Kansas City. And apparently they do. And it seems that a lot of places do. So I just wanted to quickly go over this with you. So Kansas City's underground history includes a long forgotten tunnel. In downtown Kansas City, amidst the hustle and bustle, people move from place to place in cars, buses are on their feet. They are often unaware of what is right beside them or right below them. And you know, I have to say that can be the case for a lot of places. My own town has tunnels running underneath the whole thing. Just beneath the intersection of 8th and Washington lies the old 8th Street Tunnel. It's a piece of history Kansas City forgot for 40 years. And that's how these things happen. History is simply forgotten. And once it passes a couple generations of being forgotten, it's very easy for it to be erased. Very few people still remembered it. It was lost in time. This tunnel was built in 1887. See, right around that time period again. They were the two brain trusts, Edgerton and Gilham, were the two brain trusts and financial powers. Um, it was 22 feet wide, 18 feet tall. 810 feet long, and present day it's about 100 feet shorter due to the I-670 loop. So it operated for nearly 68 years, 
and it moved people from downtown to the West Bottoms by trolley car. So I, I said this before, that it seems that in the 19th century, there was an obsession with the underground. And that's not the only thing in Kansas City. We also have in Kansas City, Subtropolis. So it's a man-made cave in the bluffs above the Missouri River in Kansas City. 55 million square foot, 1100 acre underground storage facility. It's believed to be the world's largest site of its kind. And it has trademarked the phrase, world's largest underground business complex. So that's what the entrance looks like. It looks like the entrance to a dumb, a deep underground military base. If you ask me, that's what it looks like for sure. This is supposedly just a storage facility. Here's the interior. The complex contains almost seven miles of illuminated paved roads and several miles of railroad track. Currently, 5 million square feet is occupied and 10 million square feet are improved. <laughs> wow. There's always, there's almost always some sort of construction taking place. Yeah. Wow. The underground food service warehouse stores tons of restaurant supplies. There's even an automotive alley. It's, this definitely seems to me like it could be one of those um, shelters that I talked about in my underground tunnels video about maybe holding people for a reset for or for some other kind of catastrophe those elite those select few who get to live again speculation but that's what i do in these videos we have educational supplies there 150,000 film reels that's very interesting I wonder if the original telemetry data from the moon landings could be found here. It even houses specialty food packaging. So anyway, and there's a video at the end of this. I'll leave a link to this in the description box. But anyway, that is also in Kansas City. And that's all that I have for you today. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed yet and would like to hear more of what I have to say, I would love if you would do that. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave one either here or over on Instagram. And if you like my work and would like to check out my Patreon page, I will leave a link in the description box for that as well. And I hope you have a great day.